I love changing kids because of everything I just told you. I, I didn't like that I was looking to my left and my right and I was leaving people behind. They weren't hustling with me. Um, and that was annoying to me. You know, I kept saying, I wish I had two brothers. I needed three brothers. I needed, you know, my sister to be working with me. And I, like, and so it just annoyed me that everybody didn't have this drive and this antsiness and this focus. Um, so for me, now that my wife and I have four children, um, I didn't want my kids to fall behind. So I started doing the equivalent of a boot camp on our farm in Vermont. And we started just torturing kids um, <laughs> in a good way. You know, sure. I, I got a, a mountain warfare drill instructor waking them up at five in the morning and they're doing sit-ups and push-ups in an ice cold river. They're carrying rocks up the mountain. They're getting screamed at the same way a drill instructor would scream in the movies. Um, they've got limited rations. Um, thousands of burpees, rope climbs, I mean, you name it, right? Everything in an effort to break down and build the kid back up. Yeah. And, um, and so I've been doing that, but, and that makes change, and we get to do really cool videos of doing it, but most people think I'm nuts. And welcome to the One Shot Podcast. Uh, we've had some some badass guests on this show uh, that, that are doing some great things. Uh, today, I'm not sure if we've had anybody as, as hardcore, as motivated, and is actually implementing change mm -hmm. to those that, that he interacts with more than our guests today. Uh, so kind of a little backstory. Uh, we got connected with our uh, guest today through a good friend of ours, um, Sean Buchheit at Fountain Life. And Fountain Life, if you remember, we did an episode with Dr. Cap talking about just overall wellness and and how broke our healthcare system is and what they're doing to provide uh, you know guidance on longevity and all that. Well. Uh, they introduced us to Joe and we've, Joe, we've known you or known of you and watched mm -hmm. you and followed you for years. And, uh, and, and when Sean was like, Hey, do you want to get Joe on? I was like, you, you, you know, Joe, <laughs> you serious. So, uh, so again, Joe Decina, the founder of Spartan, uh, you may know Spartan races. You may watch the show camp Spartan. Um, you may have read his books, uh, but there's, there's a mentality that, that you have implemented and created that could not have come at a more important time mm -hmm. in our country. Um, the important, the, the, the focus on resiliency, toughness, just get started, just do it. Um, and that Spartan mentality that you're doing. And uh, I, I think I want to start the show off just by saying thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the mentality that you're instilling in adults and, and as we're going to talk about here later, kids as well. So, Joe, man, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and thank you. I, I, I would have to thank my mom. You know, I, I grew up um, in the 70s in Queens. If you saw the movie Goodfellas, I grew up mm -hmm. ground zero where that uh, movie was filmed. And guys were tough. They, they, uh, they got into organized crime. It was right next to Kennedy Airport, so there were lots of trucks to uh, hijack, um, lots of things to steal, lots of bad things to do. But, but in addition, there were a lot of business owners, you know, whether it was a uh, Mason Riard or a stone Mason or uh, contractors, uh, trucking companies, you name it. And, and so you, you either ate or you got eaten in this neighborhood. <laughs> and, um, and we did eat a lot of ravioli and a lot of sausages and peppers and ganolis. And my mother in the early 70s found yoga, meditation, and health food before Lululemon existed, before there was any yoga journals or Whole Foods. She walked into probably the only health food store on the East Coast. Her mom had cancer and uh, she met a yogi and that completely changed everything and probably is the reason Spartan exists. So we have to thank her because she came home she threw out the sausage and peppers. She, um, she started teaching yoga in the living room and, and she took on a new way of life that was 
um, attempting to increase longevity uh-huh. um, and just like unscramble the American mind, right? We didn't know what we were doing. TV dinners back then, right? Uh-huh. It was just wackiness. So mom uh, deserves the thank you. She's no longer with us, but um, but anyway, that that's uh, that's where I grew up. So Joe, take us take us back a little bit more into growing up uh, in, in in Long Island, right? And in, in an area that um, you know, like you said, opportunities everywhere, but you, you're always having to watch where and what, right? There's there's dangers everywhere in, in New York, right? In the eighties, the height, height of crime. Um, it's just, it's a challenging place. So, so it does build resiliency, but what was life like at home? Uh, I know you mentioned your mom, Hey, made that transition, but what did that do to the dynamic within your family? Um, you know, what was that like? Well, mom and dad were, were physically fighting. Um, I, I, I started to believe that any kind of, um, financial pressure puts just too much pressure on the family and they were so they were fighting it was not pleasant um at all and then and the matters even got worse when she took on this new lifestyle because it was so far out there i mean my sister and i thought it was nuts everybody in the neighborhood thought it was nuts the joke was you know what's your mom cooking branch sandwiches like you know (laughs) we were having um wheat jerk like it was just awful and then there was all these people in robes coming into the living room, um, chanting and meditating. It was all nonsense. But um, they eventually got divorced. And uh, my sister and I kicked and screamed and she moved us to Ithaca, New York, which was oh. much more open-minded uh, because there's two universities in Ithaca and uh, a little more hippie-ish. Mm-hmm. And, and I went back and forth between my, my mom's house and my dad's house. and. I couldn't wait to get back to the neighborhood and figure out how to get in with these tough guys and make money and eat real food. <laughs> um, and I eventually, um, I met my, my neighbor, my father's neighbor was the head of the banana organized crime family. And he saw what was going on. He saw my thirst for my hunger for, you know, getting after it at a young age. And in my preteens, he said, why don't you come over and clean my pool? He had a beautiful house, as you can imagine, he had a pool in the backyard. And he was going to pay me, um, I think, $35 to clean his pool. You know, I'm 12 years old. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right? And um, and he sits me down when I get back there for the first day on a Saturday. And he says, here's the deal. Um, you're going to you're gonna go above and beyond. Um, even though you're, you're paid to clean the pool, you clean the window, straighten up the shed, the lawn furniture. Um, Number two, on time is late. If I tell you to get here at 8 a.m., you better be here at 7.45. And then um, number three, uh, never ask for money. Uh, mm-hmm. You'll get paid, you know, if you do a good job. Yeah. And, um, and number four, whatever you see here stays here. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. I mean, if the feds um, ever wired me up, I was in, I had 700 customers by the time I grad- graduated college, and half of them, were these guys. Oh my gosh. Wow. And, and, um, I mean, God, everybody read about, I was in everybody's house. Oh, I could could walk right into anybody's house and open the fridge and hang out. And I was incredibly trusted. And, um, and it was great because I got to look in all these families homes. Think about this 700 homes Mm. over a 12 year period. I got to look in all these homes and watch them over 12 years, watch their kids grow up, watch them cheat on their wives, watch them go to jail. I watched the whole thing go down. I was part of their lot, their, their families. And, and, um, and in my mind, I guess subconsciously, I said, gee, when I have a family, I'm going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so it was this big fishbowl. Um, it was awesome. I don't even, I, I mean, I don't even know how a kid today would have access. It was unbelievable what no. I had access to. Well, and I think, you know, there's the, there's the, entrepreneurship of organized crime, right? Like you've got to, you got to be tight on the books. I mean, more scrutinized than really most any business because they're trying to catch you and think how, how tight everything's got to be. And this is me speaking from movie experience. So you lived it. So this, (laughs) that's not, but I, I could imagine the, the things that you saw and learned, okay. What comes with success? Okay. 
I see if you do that and you just give into the success, that could happen. Um, and when you relax, you know, this could happen. I can't imagine all of the lessons that you learned through that process. Now, when we, when we were talking about you starting a pool, uh, pool cleaning business, I'm like, New York? I mean, <laughs> pools? I mean, I could see if like you're in like Phoenix or California or Texas here, but I, it makes sense now. It, it, it totally makes sense. Um, so, so you, you were working through, what was your, what was high school, what was school like for you? Was, was that, did you ever look at that? Like, Hey, I take care of school. Then I've got opportunities to grow from there. Or was it, Hey, look, I'm learning and getting knowledge on, I mean, for lack of a better term on the streets. Yeah. I, you know, I was in school in, um, in Queens. I was always in trouble. I was in a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And then when I left, my mom took me to Ithaca and I went to a public school. I immediately got in trouble for selling fireworks. I was, I was somehow importing fireworks from Queens to Ithaca and selling them and making a lot of money. And, um, and the reason I got caught was, uh, lunch back then was a dollar. Everybody mm -hmm. had a dollar to pay for lunch. Mm -hmm. And most of the boys in the school stopped buying lunch cause they were buying packs of firecrackers from me. <laughs> so lunch sales went way down and, uh, that tipped them off and they found me. Um, so I got thrown out of school. Uh, my mom got so upset that she um, enlisted me in the only Catholic school in the area, which was an hour away. Ooh. And she was going to drive me every day. Wow. I thought she was going to fold by the time September came around. So I wasn't really worried. I'd, I'd be able to stay with my friends, my new friends. And um, sure enough, she didn't fold. She was tough. And she drove me that hour. And she pulled off the highway. Now, now she had to drop me off, go back home and come back. Right. So she was doing four hours a day and, um, and she would drop me off at uh, a kid's house who also went to the school, but that was like another 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So she, you can't blame her. Right. She pulled off the highway, dropped me off there in the morning. And then when that kid got up, I would go, well, it turns out, that kid, his dad owned a funeral home and the home she was dropping me off to was the funeral home. So every morning I would go in their house and wait for this kid to come downstairs. I forget his name. And uh, Kalik. Kalik was the name of the funeral home in Elmira, New York. I can't believe I just remembered that. <laughs> and, and every day there was a dead body sitting there meeting me while I waited. And I couldn't wait to get the fuck back to Ithaca and get out of this nonsense. See, it's all perspective, right? Like, why am I leaving Queens? This is where all my friends are at. You take me to Ithaca, where's Ithaca? And then you go to this funeral home, you're like, Ithaca is actually not that bad. I really kind of like that place. So, so, um, so, but nobody guided me. Nobody um, in, in Howard Beach was going to college. So nobody guided me on college or the military or any of that stuff. It was, it was people own businesses or they, or they stole from businesses. Um, and that's how they made money. And, and I just wanted to get back to the neighborhood and they had nice cars and you, you gotta imagine the houses, um, that I was, uh, that I had access to and those families I had access to while they were doing well were ridiculous. I mean, five mm. cars in the driveway, um, people had money. Um, at least, at least it appeared they had lots of money. And, and so I didn't, college wasn't even on the radar. When I was, after that year, I did so well, my mother probably got tired of driving and uh, put me back into the high school in Ithaca. And I made it through. And now my business was getting bigger and bigger and bigger in Queens. And I planned on heading right back to Queens upon graduating high school. I was done with school. My grades weren't that good. And my friend at Ithaca High, about three months before we graduated, said, hey, um, why don't we go to Cornell? And I said, how the hell would we go to Cornell? And my SAT scores are terrible. Like, he goes, my dad's a professor. He'll get us in. And so I thought, oh, well, that's the way it works in the neighborhood, right? We got a guy. He'll get yeah. us in. So, um, so we both applied. We both did interviews. We were late to the process. And neither of us got in. Mm. And, um, and so that was it. I was heading back to Queens. And he said, hang on. My dad said we could go extramurally, which is we could take three classes each in the fall when everybody else goes, when our class goes, 
And if we do well, we reapply in the winter and we'll get in for second semester. So all we gotta do is do well, first semester. And so I said to myself, well, I'll, I'll go back to Queens this summer, run my business, I'll go to St. John's. I'll take a couple of classes at St. John's University in Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. I'll, um, I'll learn how to study. I'll, um, since everybody else is gonna be doing five classes in September, we, we can only do three, I, I won't be falling behind. And my friend said, screw that. I'm going to go to Vegas. We're going to party all summer. Why would we, if we know we got to go, you know, buckle down in September. And, and that, was, that was a real big lesson for me. That was the ability to delay gratification, like save the mm -hmm. fun for later. Mm -hmm. I, got work, I got work to do now. And um, he went to Vegas. I went to St. John's. I studied hard. We met in September. We both went through our semester. I crushed it for me. I mean, I might as well have been a rocket scientist. I never got paid back. I would work so hard. And um, I was working so hard, I bought myself a briefcase. I had a briefcase I carried around. I yes. Worked so and, um, and then we reapplied, and neither of us got in again. Uh, oh. And he tapped out. He went to Vegas. And, um, and he went to UNLV. I continued on, and I did another semester reapplied, they denied me, did another semester, reapplied, they denied me. By the fourth time, I was done. I was mm. packing it in, told my mom, I'm going to New York, I'm going to run my business. My business was doing well at the time. Uh, clearly, this wasn't for me. They don't want me, I don't want them. And um, my mom said, hang on, I teach yoga to this woman, Professor uh, Racine. I don't know what she does, but she's willing to meet with you. Because she didn't, you know, as a parent, you don't want your kid to leave. Once they're out, mm -hmm. they're gone. Yeah. Right. right. So I, um, I took the meeting and I sat down with Professor Racine and, and she said, oh, I see your grades are pretty good. Um, I run, she said, I run the textile department. Do you like textiles? I didn't even know what a textile was. She said, um, I've got 92 women in the department and no men and we want some diversity. I said, I love textiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a textile is. That's right. <laughs> I'm in. Sold. So, so, um, so she accepted me. She changed my life. And, um, and I studied textiles. And to this day, I could watch a movie and look at women's hemlines and tell you what era it's from. <laughs> and, I would do, and I would do it again if I had to do it because we studied, we studied the business mm -hmm. of um, you know, the textile industry. And yeah. it was going yeah. through this upheaval. At the time, um, all, the, all the plants and factories in the U.S. were being shut down. It was moving over to China. There were quota issues. So we, we studied the business, uh, of, of, you know, a business that was in turmoil, mm -hmm. an industry that was in turmoil. So, so that was awesome. Um, when I was graduating, uh, you asked one question. I'm going for a while. I no, this is, this is gold. When I was graduating, I, um, I said, let me press my luck. There's this MBA program I heard about. Can you imagine a guy from Queens? I'm playing the tape in my head, right? I get an MBA. Well, not only did I graduate college, but I get an MBA. Mm. And, um, and I took this class, this entrepreneurship class in, the, in the, business, the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell. And we had to come up with a business plan, present it to a bunch of judges in the class, and Reuniti Wines, the, the, the two brothers that own Reuniti Wines, were going to give a $5,000 uh, check to the winner. Anyway, I presented my plan. My plan was to take uh, champion sweatshirts. Remember champion sweatshirts? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, many of the schools used to sew satin letters on the name of the school and the champion sweatshirt. I was going to do that overseas. I was going to change the, um, the, the wristbands and the, and the collars and the waistband because they would blow out in a champion sweatshirt. I was going to infuse spandex in them so that they would stretch and come back to form. And they loved it. The judges loved it. I ended up winning. And so I got this $5,000 check, but more importantly, I became friends with one of the judges who was Italian mm. and he lived up in Ithaca and we became buddies. And he said to me, what are you doing when you graduate? And I said, well, I'm going to go run my business. I might do this sweatshirt thing now. And uh, he said, you're an idiot. You got to go to wall street. I can see it in you. You need to be on wall street. And I said, whatever. I said, um, 1987 crash three years ago. Like, there's no money on Wall Street. I don't even know what it is. I want to go back. I want to hang out with Gotti and uh, all these wise guys. <laughs> and, um, and so I left. I graduated. 
oh, I didn't get in. I didn't get into the MBA pro program. They didn't accept me. So um, I left, went back to the neighborhood, started running my business, continued to build it. And this guy called me every month, every 30 days called me, picked up the phone. What are you doing? When are you going to Wall Street? When are you selling that stupid business in Queens? And um, after about 48 phone calls, 48 months, literally. Mm -hmm. So now, now it's four years out of college. He, um, he tells me to buy a stock. And I had never bought a stock. He says, you got to buy a stock. You got to buy the stock, Syntex. He was trying to entice me to get me motivated to get the hell out of Queens. And I said, whatever. And um, one of my customers owed me a lot of money I was going to pick up that day. I can't believe I'm remembering all this. A customer's <laughs> name was uh, Eli Novak. Novik. And the customer, back then, by the way, my memory, I had all the phone numbers of all those customers. Seven, I literally in my head, I have no idea. I, I, you know, what? back then, that's what you had that's to do. You had to. Like, right. if you're going to communicate, you're going to walk over to the wall, you're going to pull yeah. the phone off, and you had to remember them. Or you pulled out your booklet that had all the names. Exactly. So, so, um, so anyway, he, this guy was a pharmacist. He owed me like 150 grand because I had just done a whole bunch of work wow. to his house. I was, yeah. we were beyond cleaning pools. Now we were, we were putting swimming pools in, in the ground. We were doing brickwork, mm. we were uh, windows, house, you know, construction. So, um, so anyway, he owed me $150,000. I was going to pick it up and I said, Eli, you're a pharmacist. My friend gave me this stock pick today called Syntex. And Eli, we just got out of the shower. He was like towel drying his hair. He said, um, he said, I can't believe you're bringing that up. He goes, I, I was going to buy that stock today. I said, really? He sits me down in his kitchen. That's where most people hung out in the neighborhood, in the kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. and we sat down in the kitchen, and he called his broker in front of me, and he bought 10,000 shares. The stock was $14 a share, 140 grand he spent in front of me, in addition to giving me my check, which he owed me. And I thought, this guy's nuts. And, um, and he said, you're single? He said, you're making money? This is the perfect time to take risks. Um, and he convinces me with his broker to buy uh, $140,000 worth of stock with his check that he's given me. Wow. So I buy the stock, and um, the next day, I kid you not, the next day, the company got taken over. And I made hundred grand in 24 hours. <laughs> and I, so did they split Is at that point? No, no. I paid, so I paid $14 a share, uh -huh. and I got paid for Twenty-four dollars a share the next day. Oh my! So God. I was up. I was up ten dollars on ten thousand shares. I made a hundred grand, and I said, "I'm going to Wall Street, man." This is <laughs> yeah, I'm in. <laughs> I want to take a quick break and thank our partners Sleep Number and highlight a couple of things they're doing. Guys, these Sleep Number beds are unreal. The technology that they've created, the feedback that it gives you on your sleep. I've got the app opened up right here. They tell you things like your heart rate, your heart rate variability, your breathing rate, all these type uh, metrics and feedback to give you so that you can improve your quality of sleep. They're all over the place. You can go and check yourself out at Sleep Number store wherever you live. Go to sleepnumber.com as well. They've got great resources on there. We just talked about this not too long ago. They have a whole blog section, all these articles, things that you can improve your health. Sleep Number is definitely changing the game when it comes to betting. So get yourself to Sleep Number, get yourself to sleepnumber.com and check them out. Now back to the episode. You know, you know, I'm listening to your story. Did you ever have, it sounds like you, you were always staying present, you know, with what you were doing at the time. Did you ever have any long-term vision or goal or like, this is what I hope to do one day, or is it more just living day by day and whatever comes up, that's what I'm going to do. It's funny. Nobody's ever really asked me that question. And, um, and unlike some very successful friends, I have ridiculously successful friends who lay out their map and their journey. Um, and then work backwards from it, which I think is a, a really smart um, way to run your life, your business, whatever, your relationships, right? Work backwards from that. Uh, and I give advice to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I did it. Mm -hmm. I think, I, think I, I take an approach of fire ready aim. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I really do. And I, and I, you know, we'll go back to my childhood, but I'll tell you this weekend, this week is the 70th anniversary of the 10th Special Forces Group, and they're located in uh, Fort Carson. Mm -hmm. And I had to go speak on Monday. There's 2,500 um, operators there and then about 1,000 support. 
and I had to give um, a speech. And I guess my message to them was exactly that, that I just, um, because it, it's opposite of the military, right? The military, you're going to, you're going to measure 10 mm-hmm. times and then mm-hmm. once. And for me, I just saw so many kids when I was growing up and building my business prior to going to Cornell, I saw so many kids that were just stuck. Mm-hmm. They were in indecision. They were talking about, they have to find something they want to do like all this nonsense. And my feeling was kind of like, um, I don't know, you talk about uh, atoms in science in high school, you know, atoms bouncing around. Mm -hmm. My feeling was if I was just bouncing around, I was going to bump into something um, that was interesting. And sure enough, even this weekend at Fort Carson's, I could have said, gee, I love our military. I want to give back. I don't really have the time to do the speeches, but I want to do it. But I ended up meeting somebody Mm -hmm. and and it it changes it. And then I ended up meeting this other recruiter who taught me something. I came home and I said, Jack, to my oldest son, you know, you can go in the military while you're in high school and still go to college. I didn't know that until three days ago had I not gone out to Fort Carson's, right? right. So that changes my son's whole life. Mm-hmm. Or, or back up 15 years ago and somebody says that they taught their kid Mandarin and this is the way they did it. And so, boom, I come home and all our kids are learning Mandarin. Mm-hmm. So that wouldn't have been on my plan. Right. Had I not been out just meeting people and just kind of figuring it out. For well, sure. and I think... I. Think about the opportunities you could miss because you're looking at that goal that's you know 10 miles ahead of you and the opportunities for some awesome awesome things that you miss all along the way if you're not there and present. And I mean it sounds like that's where a lot of opportunities and pivoting and you know whether it's pool business or Wall Street or it's extreme races or it's whatever it is it's because you were able to pivot and and adjust. Like one of the things in our company our day job we're, we're in real estate is, you know, champions adjust. You have to be able to pivot. And if you're so fixated on one thing, and again, not that that's a bad, not, it's not bad to have a plan. It's not bad to be working towards something, but if you are so rigid in that path, if you're on that monorail, right. And you can't do anything like you're going to miss a ton of things along the way and opportunities along the way. Like you just mentioned. I like, I like that a lot. I mean, I, I'm sure if we did the analysis, my smart friends would say, if we did the analysis, Joe, all those things you bumped into and, you know, look, let's look back at my friend that decided to go to um, UNLV, mm-hmm. right? right? When I said, so he's got a giant medical marijuana business now, right? <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, um, there's many paths, mm-hmm. there's many paths. And, and, but for me, it also has to work for you, the individual. Right. Yeah. And yep. For me, I love the chaos of yeah. it. I love the excitement mm-hmm. of just pivoting and ch- mm-hmm. turning left and turning right. And um, and I think I'm pretty good at keeping my eye on the prize at the same time. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it's important. I, you just said it though, right? Everybody's path is different. Everybody's personality is different. Everybody's pain threshold is different. Um, you have to, I think... One thing as I'm listening to you tell your story and have listened to you in the past is one thing is you you have an extreme amount of self-awareness and okay, understanding who I am, what I am, what's going on around me, and that comes maybe with the presence that you have, but it's you have to first say okay, who am I? And am I am I a structured person that we talk about this a lot, right? Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur because it's super sexy. But like, if you're not built that way and you don't have that threshold, look, there's nothing wrong with being a blue collared worker and working. And if that's what fits you, I mean, think about how short we are in this country right now for people that are actually going to go do the work because everybody wants a white collar job. Everybody wants this sexy, high paying. It's cool to be an entrepreneur. It's, it's, it's all that. But how are you going to get shit done if you don't have people that can do it? And there's nothing wrong with that if you are that type of person to say, hey, look, I'm going to be the best damn mason ever, or I'm going to be the best damn concrete guy or excavator or uh, whatever the whatever the job may be. But understanding who you are and what your strengths are, I think is important because, look, that's what's going to guide my path. I am. Um, first of all, I think. I think right now, if you're a young person, you listen. And by the way, when I say young. If you're a 30 year under, mm-hmm. um, becoming an electrician, <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh, an excavator, 
um, become a mason, become a plumber, you'll kill it. Crush it. Crush it. And, and we, we got a little downturn coming here. Mm-hmm. And during that downturn, there'll be even you know, more plumbers and more electricians that tap out. Yep. And, um, and I'd, be, I'd be rolling up my sleeves and getting, getting in that game right now. That were me. And that's, I literally have a conversation with my, I've got a, a eight year old son. Um, and it's like, Hey, listen, like, I know it's super young. You want to be an NFL player and you want to do this and that's all cool. But if you were to learn a trade and you sprinkle in a little bit of business savvy in that you could crush it. Cause there's three things I think it, like a tradesman. Well, yes, you've got to have the skill. You've got to have the trade. But if you, if you answer your phone, <laughs> If you show up when you say you're going to show up and you do what you say you're going to do, make a killing yeah. because you can't find those people. No, there's very few of them. And then I was mentioning um, before you got on before, because of my trip to Fort Carson's last week or shit this weekend that just passed, um, I think we could change the whole country with one slight adjustment to our military programs. And, and so we should do a change.org. Um, and try to get tons of people to sign it. And I will literally go to the Pentagon uh, to make this happen. I think, so right now, if you go ROTC to pay for college, you've got a pretty big commitment coming out of college. Mm -hmm. And a lot of kids just don't want that commitment, right? They don't Mm -hmm. want to spend another five, six years post-college doing that. And I think what we should do is actually do pre-college. So let kids go in the reserves, whatever it is, as a sophomore, a junior, let's say, go to basic training, kick their ass, teach them some trades, um, turn them into men and women before they get to college, so they don't do stupid shit, yep. and then um, get them through college. And then when they come out, they, let's say we only, they only have a two-year commitment left. Everything's paid for. you got money in your pocket. You will literally transform this entire country. You'll have no more recruiting issues. Um, we, we got to figure that out because um, I'm big on making impact back yeah. to what you said earlier. Like we got one shot at this and what the hell am I doing on this planet? All right. Mm-hmm. That's cool. You made a bunch of money. That's cool. You got a nice house. You got a great family. Like, but what did you really do yeah. to impact a bunch of people? I think that, I think that would impact that initiative. Yeah. Yeah. That that's future thinking, but you are making impact now on youth and you've got a really cool, unique uh, program that you're putting kids through. Talk to us about that and talk to us about how you are taking action and you are changing the next generation. Yeah, I mean, I, I, look, I love, I love changing kids because of everything I just told you. I, I didn't like that I was looking to my left and my right and I was leaving people behind. They weren't hustling with me. Um, and that was annoying to me. You know, I kept saying, I wish I had two brothers. I needed three brothers. I needed, you know, my sister to be working with me. And I, like, and so it just annoyed me that everybody didn't have this drive and this antsiness and this focus. Um, so for me, now that my wife and I have four children, um, I didn't want my kids to fall behind. So I started doing the equivalent of a boot camp on our farm in Vermont. And we started just torturing kids um, <laughs> in a good way. You know, sure. I, I got a, a mountain warfare drill instructor waking them up at five in the morning and they're doing sit-ups and push-ups in an ice cold river. They're carrying rocks up the mountain. They're getting screamed at the same way a drill instructor would scream in the movies. Um, they've got limited rations, um, thousands of burpees, rope climbs. I mean, you name it, right? Everything in an effort to break down and build the kid back up. Yeah. And, um, and so I've been doing that, but, and that makes change and we get to do really cool videos of doing it, but most people think I'm nuts. <laughs> Uh, there's two people sitting right here that do not think yeah. that because I think, I think that this should be implemented in every single city. I'm not even talking about, Oh, DFW. No, like you need to have one in Dallas. You need to have one in Addison. You need to have one in Plano. You need to have one in Frisco, <laughs> three in Frisco. Uh, you need to have two in Prosper. But, I mean, this is what our youth need because there's an absence of what you're teaching these kids. No, the funny thing is so many parents call me. And they want me to take the kids, but then the kid like squawks, right? And mm-hmm. and of course the kid like the number one motivator, people don't realize the number one motivator for a human being, for the three of us, for everybody, mm-hmm. is the avoidance of discomfort. Yes. So 
Do you think the kid really wants to go do the hard? No, the kid wants to play video games. The kid wants to eat ice cream. My kid's included. And so somebody's got to be bold enough to say, hey, we're raising adults here. We're not, we're not making friends. That's not mm-hmm. about making friendships. Like, mm-hmm. the kid'll, the, like I did with my mother, the kid will figure out when the kid is 30 years old, oh, my God, thank God they did yeah. that for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, we talked about it last week. It's the effort paradox, too, right? That's, you understand that effort is, is costly, but it also provides tons of value. Mm-hmm. And so as a parent, the, the innate feeling, at least for me, is I want to protect my kids. I want to save them from suffering. I want to save, you know, I want to constantly do things for them to help them out. Mm-hmm. But what I'm really doing is I'm really robbing them from the value of that effort that they're going through and the value of that suffering. And what I love that you're doing is, is, and correct me if I'm wrong, you started with your children first, correct? And now it's blown up into other people's kids as well. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, we, I, I, uh, next week I head up for, um, this is, I think, our third summer doing it. And uh, I, I, I stopped it at 50 kids um, oh. just because I, I, mean, I could probably take 300 kids. Sure, yeah. But I just... It's just a lot to deal with, and it's really just a side show for everything else I'm doing, for right. sure. Is it is it kids from all over the place? Are they all coming from all over the country? All over the place. Um, a couple of international kids, too. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could do it, and I love doing it, but it's another responsibility to, t- you know, t- to, go, to go big. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know what? A lot of parents, I, I know a lot of wealthy people, and a lot of parents will send me their kids at 21 years old and get them to the farm and say, it's a lot harder at 21. It's a lot easier at eight. Yeah. Right. You know, I was, I was at, my buddy's a colonel. I told you I was just in, in, in Fort Carson. And I, I stayed over his house. And he's got two wonderful little children. One of them is two. And, um, and the wife uh, comes from a Japanese lineage, right? Uh-huh. So I said, um, I said, how come he's not watching that show? He loves cars. He loves little show cars. How come he's not watching it in... Um, Japanese. And they said, what do you mean? I said, we got to find that in Japanese. The kid loves the show so much. Mm-hmm. They should only be watching it in another language. Before you know it, that kid is going to be speaking Japanese. I kid you not. Ten minutes in, the kid was spitting out Japanese words. No, no. no. At two years old. Ten minutes out. My kids are fluent in Mandarin for the same reason. And so um, it just requires a little effort on yeah. the parent's part. Mm-hmm. Um, and and suffering on the parents' part because you gotta find you gotta find Japanese audio like it's hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes effort. Yeah. <laughs> I, so so that's I think that's a great point. So you you take these kids and you have them for a few is it three weeks is yeah, the typical be, Spartan camp. Yeah, this will be three weeks. Yeah. Okay. So the challenge is 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 even in our age, right? We're I'm 37 and I and I'm now at the age where I'm saying these kids, these kids, these kids, right? And acting like the kids are the problem. The the reality is that's not the case is we as parents, you just mentioned it, we are avoiding discomfort. We're avoiding disciplining our kids at the restaurant because they're acting up. And so we give them an iPad. Mm-hmm. We are avoiding um our kids getting hurt, so we don't let them go out and play and have free play, right? We want to protect them because it's, if they get hurt, ugh, I got to now I got to go to the hospital. Or we're avoiding spending time having real conversations with them because I've got to work because I want the lifestyle that I want. And parents, and and look, I'm, me included, it's the the avoidance of discomfort, like you just mentioned, is hindering our kids and their ability to be fully functioning productive adults. So when you take these kids for three weeks, and I'll, I'll correlate it to this, it's you can send your dog off to dog training and it can come back trained, but it becomes untrained very quick if as a dog owner, you're not continuing with the discipline that they've been taught. So same with the kids. Yeah, I just called my kid dogs. I just said <laughs> they are dogs. But how do how are you delivering to the parents to say okay hey look here are some of the things that we did we we broke them but we built them back up but here is how you can continue on this trajectory we do i mean at the end of the day i wrote so i wrote a book called um uh 10 i don't even know what the hell i call my book I remembered all those names from right right 10 yeah no no yeah we saw it earlier yeah yeah 
It just and came out last year, 21, right? Yeah. Yep. And, and, and so there's a lot of tips and tricks in there on how to parent mm -hmm. and how to run your family um, to build more resilience. But, mm -hmm. but it's as simple as making the kid do the work, period, <laughs> full stop. And this, yep. like, kids got to do the work. Kids got to figure it out. Um, and by the way, like I'm, I'm talking a tough game here, mm -hmm. but I fail at it too. It could be much tougher. I'm like, I was telling these guys when I was on Fort Carson's over the weekend, I was talking about Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if the three of us were on the Lewis and Clark expedition, you know, like the wheel breaks, we're stuck in the, like shit falls apart. And they responded and said, think about Sacagawea. She had to carry a two year old baby the whole time. Like, and so when we think about like, that's gonna be too hard on the kid, that's too stressful on the kid, that's too dangerous for the kid, says who? Mm -hmm. Says who most of our existence on this planet was 500 times more difficult in a normal day than what we live with now. Right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Is it weird like, I got the book name by the way. Yeah. 10 Rules for Resilience, Mental Toughness for Families. Yep. All right, so get, here's here, Joe. Out. We're gonna do a book <laughs> review on this because we'll 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 run through some books. We're we're running through it. Yeah, uh, for yeah. sure. But is it is it sick though that like you know the show 1883? You know, a spinoff of Yellowstone, talking about going from they really go from Texas and end up in Montana. And I'm like, and I literally thought about my kids. I'm like, see, that's what we're missing. Is we're missing <laughs> struggle. We're missing pain. We're missing the fear of getting shot with an arrow. This is what we need for our kids. Yeah. And I was like, I, I wish that I could do that. We need kids getting shot with arrows. That's yeah. exactly what we need. Yeah, with a cool Winchester 1894 <laughs> lever action rifle. I mean, riding on your horse. I mean, that's that's the dream, isn't right. it? That's right. <laughs> I'm going to do um, a better one for you. I'm, just, I'm pulling out my glasses and looking um, for two boys that back in the ninth, when, when Roosevelt was um, president, mm -hmm. find it. The father said, um, yeah, they're, they're called the free range kids. Yeah. Um, two boys, six years old and 10 years old. Ready for this? They rode horses to New York um, on their own, six years old and 10 years old, looking at the Washington Post, from Oklahoma in 1910 on their own. <laughs> And, and we can't and, we can't put our kids on school buses anymore because yeah. it's too dangerous. <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting my wife on blast Lewis, right now. <laughs> Lewis and Temple Abernathy set out on horseback for New York from a ranch in Tillman County, Oklahoma, when they were ten and six years old. The trek wasn't even the boys' first long distance ride. They had traveled to Santa Fe, New Mexico the previous year. Wow. So you got you gotta um we gotta somehow talk about that in one yeah. of your future podcast. Well, uh, well um, we, we were talking about it before we started pressing record the book, you know, The Coddling of the American Mind. You said you'd read it. And one of the suggestions he makes at the very end of the book is let your kids walk to school. And so yeah. it's just funny hearing what you just said. And we're having to convince <laughs> parents to let our kids walk to school. So it's just... That's funny. Well, we know you're short on time and, and, and we're coming up against it here. And, and we didn't even touch on a massive oh. part of your story. But what I'm curious about is, you know, as you look back on your life and as you look at where you are now, like what excites you going forward? What, what are you hoping to do now with this next phase of life after all that you've accomplished, all that you've done, all the action you've taken? What are you hoping to do next? All right, I want to take a quick minute to talk about our partner, Choctaw Casino and Resort. Uh, we are really, really humbled uh, and grateful to be a partner for them. If you've listened to the show for any amount of time, uh, you've heard how great the resort is there, how great the casino is, the new expansion. They've doubled in size, 3,000 new slots. They've got unbelievable sports bar. They've got unbelievable restaurants, unbelievable movie theaters, arcades for kids. It is endless, the things that they've not only improved but added. Um, but it's just an the, the experience that they provide is second to none. Choctaw Nation has done an incredible job with the community, with philanthropy, with support. Um, they have just done incredible things. So we are extremely humbled and grateful to partner with Choctaw Casino and Resort. Make sure, I know you know it, but it's just a short drive of 75. Go check them out. And now back to the episode. I, I, I've learned, my mother used to say, be careful what you say because it turns into reality, which I didn't believe mm -hmm. at all. But but for the last, you know, 10, 12 years, I've been saying we're going to create an Olympic sport out of obstacle racing. It looks like that's happening, knock on wood, 2028. Awesome. So Yes. So that's amazing, right? We've changed 
10 million lives. I got 90 million to go. But I guess my dream right now, as of three days ago, I got to somehow get the Department of Defense to change how we do this whole ROTC program yeah. with kids. Yeah. That's literally the last three days on my mind. So I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that. Mm. Um, and I, and I want to make a, um, I want to make a, a full feat, you know, a movie in Hollywood. I wrote, I wrote a book, um, a fictional book a, around ancient Sparta. And I'm, I'm excited that someday before this journey is over for me, mm -hmm. that will be like a really high production value movie like Batman Begins. Yes. But, but around the ancient Sparta. So I'm excited about that. Man, that's, that's amazing. So uh, again, like Ben said, we, we didn't get to cover a lot, um, but I would encourage you, whether you're looking on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, look up Joe DeSena. Um, you know, he's shared his story. I mean, there's all, there's so many nuggets. Like I love, I love that you have a name for your brain. Like, and actually, you know what, let's talk about that for just a second. Um, how you, how you battle that inner dialogue. So like, I'm really big on controlling the inner dialogue that you have with yourself, not listening to it. I had this, we talked about it the other day. I had this conversation with my eight year old son the other, the other day, cause he wanted to quit a workout because he struggles with the negative self-talk that he has in his head. But talk us through your strategy. You, you said a, a mentor, someone shared this with you, but talk through how you battle that inner dialogue. Well, there's a couple of strategies. I, I've, I've done a lot of podcasts, talked to a lot of folks, and um, mm. one strategy is allowing yourself a way out. Um, I don't feel like doing the workout this morning. I don't feel like doing the burpees. I don't feel like doing the bike ride. I don't feel like going to work. And say to yourself, all right, Rather than the 300 burpees we planned, mm -hmm. we're just going to do 10. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have that conversation, um, I named my brain, right? I call it Frank. Mm -hmm. I had an uncle Frank. <laughs> <laughs> so Frank, Frank is like, I don't want to do, I don't want to do those 300 burpees. And so, you know, you get a piece of paper early in the morning, you woke up, I'm drinking my water, write it down, don't want to do the burpees, uh, got a payroll problem, you know, you're laying out. They're usually not super positive thoughts early in the morning, right? They're the stuff that you got to deal with. Right. Yeah. Frank are having this discussion. I'm laying out these three or four or five items. And, um, and then you come up with solutions right there with Frank, right? All right. We're just going to do 10 of the 300. Now, the reality is once you get going, yep. you convince Frank, we're going to knock out the whole yep. 300. Shut and the I hell up, Frank. <laughs> yeah. This morning, this morning I had, I had another 10 pull-ups to go. I had, I left like, three different exercises on the table because I was fucking around with some phone calls to Singapore and I just wasted some time. I shouldn't have wasted. Mm. Uh, but I, I accepted it. I had a conversation with Frank. I said, I know we were doing whatever. Right. So we, we got, we got done. What we, we got a lot done anyway. And so I think, I think if you go through those things early in the morning, you have that conversation with your brain, with yourself, and then when they come up again, because sometimes, most of the time, we're on a, a, a loop tape, mm -hmm. and it comes up, and it comes up, and it comes up, you say, Frank, we already discussed this. We already resolved it. What the fuck are you doing? You know? And, and, and that it sounds silly, but um, it works. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, no, sure. perfect sense. We, we had this conversation with Darren, and Darren will have conversations, and he, and he talks in the third person. And there's this skill and it's kind of, it's kind of the same thing. Um, I love that you identify, okay, hey, look, I, I'm targeting you. Whereas Darren kind of just generally like, hey, Darren, we're going to do this, man. You can do this, Darren. You can, you know, you can do it. Whereas is, it's like, no, 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 Frank. All you're doing is wasting time. We already went through this. Like you're now getting in the way of other tasks. So get in the back seat, shut up, buckle up. And, and eat your popsicle. And I'm going to go get to work. And, and I love that because now, I mean, one, it's like, now you can talk to somebody and if you're, if somebody hears you like, Oh, he must have your pieces in and he's talking. He's not, he's not totally crazy. But when you identify that now you can actually address it and, and you identify and say, okay, it's not me. I'm not worthless. I'm not this. I'm not that. It's like, Hey, I'm going to identify this part of my brain that is, is negative and hindering me from progress. Well, I'm going to call it out, call it out. Like it is. It's a whole lot easier to call your friend out. Like, mm -hmm. like Ben calls me out every day. Hey, Tyler, get your lazy ass out of bed. Let's get to work. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot easier to do that than, hey, get up. You need to do this. So I, I, well, I love that strategy. Yeah, it's easier. And we had a psychologist, his name's Ethan Cross, on a while back. And he wrote a book called Chatter, talking about this exact thing. 
And it's not only easier, but it, it allows you to be more rational as mm -hmm. well. It allows you to step back from the emotion of the situation and be a third party observer. You can always give a better advice to your friend than you do yep. yourself. Yep. That's the strategy and that's why it's so key and so so valuable. So mm. I love that. Well, we know we gotta let you go. We, we definitely wanna have you back on yeah, at some point. We'd love to. And um, any way we can, I, I, you're 100% you're onto something with the ROTC thing. Um, I mean, there's so many benefits, like a chain reaction of benefits that could come from that, from getting them one, just building more resilient, tougher kids because they actually are handling adversity. But think about what that can do and the, the catapult that that can take some kid that may not have an opportunity. Now he gets involved, he gets exposed. And all these people that are so afraid to go into the military, okay, hey, there's a, a million avenues that I can go and that, that can turn into things after, you know, post-service. So I we're 100% on board. So let's let's continue to stay in touch any way we can support that. Um, we're, we're all about it. I appreciate it. And um, I, you guys are in Texas. Let's mm -hmm. look. Shoot me an email. Anybody can shoot me an email, joe at spartan.com. Yep. Um, I'm going to get you our schedule. And let, I would challenge you, I don't know if you guys are affiliated with any charities or not, but I'll connect you with a charity or you give me your charity. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a bunch of entries and I'm going to challenge you to round up, energize your audience yeah. to meet you at one of our events on me, no charge. And, um, and we'll use it to raise money for charity. Awesome. I love it. Love it. Yes. We are, we're 100% in and we'll awesome. connect more on that. But yeah, that's a, that's an initiative that we, uh, we are pushing forward. So we love awesome. that. Awesome. Joe, Joe, thank you so much. Uh, you, appreciate what you're doing. Appreciate the impact that you're making. Again, Joe DeSena, um, podcast, Spartan Up. Uh, go check out his books. There's a, the, You've written three or four now? Four. Four, four books, books now. Um, there's there is some gold. And, and talk about resilience. Talk about toughness. Talk about just getting started and figure it out. Like, all it, it really does take just that initial, hey, I got to get started. The momentum will take you and you're living proof of that. And so, man, I, I encourage anybody that's listening, watching to go follow Joe. You can find him on the Joe Rogan podcast. That was a great episode, by the way, um, in, in anywhere else. But, but Spartan.com is the website. Uh, if you've got some rascal kids that you need to send up to Vermont, look into that. I would highly encourage it. Uh, and hopefully maybe, uh, Joe will let us run a Texas branch of that, uh, of that outfit. <laughs> All right, I'll see you guys. Thanks, right, Joe. Joe. Thanks.